And today um, she will present um, her talk, um, Seeing the Forest and the Tree, Decomposing Representation of Neural Activity to Reveal Features of Individual Neuron and Their Population Level Dynamics. That right. sounds very interesting. It's, it's a long title. <laughs> Sorry to um, and um, Eva is um, a very accomplished uh, researcher. She has uh, earned several awards. Um, the, uh, the NSF Career Award, the Next Generation Leader Award from the Allen Institute, um, and she's also a Cypher Global Scholar in the Learning and Machine and Brain um, program. So really looking forward for your talk. Great. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here with you all. Um, yeah, so I, uh, as um, the intro thing like recently became a CIFAR scholar. So I've had the chance to come to Montreal a few times recently. This is the coldest that it's been, um, but it's it's great to be back here and with the community. So, so my title today is a bit of a mouthful, um, but you know, kind of there's this growing idea in, in computational neuroscience to kind of look at the collective or population level dynamics amongst neurons or other neural signals that we can record from in the brain and and from that trying to make inferences about complex behavior and kind of see how the population of neurons all come together to create some sort of behavior output. Um, but a lot of times when we build those sorts of models, we might actually lose sight of what individual neurons might be doing, right? We're treating all of these neurons kind of as a collective circuit without any particular individual function. And so the goal of this talk or kind of the main body of, of what I'll talk about today is some new work that we're doing along these lines of both trying to see what populations of neurons are doing, as well as find Kind of features or extract embeddings that are specific to individual neurons with the goal of you know kind of putting it all together into understanding what different neurons are doing as well as what they do um, in a collective circuit okay great so just in terms of the motivation a lot of the work that we do in my lab is really driven um, you know, in this space of neuroscience and AI, a lot of the work that we do is really coming from the place of, you know, taking AI, building new tools that allow us to build insights and interpret what large populations or the activity of, of, of to, to the, okay, okay. So very loud in that case. Is this okay? Okay. This is okay. So um, yeah, so just in terms of motivation, what we do in the lab is, um, you know, really driven from this fact that we are uh, quickly amassing, you know, larger and larger collections of data from the brain. Um, neural data sets are growing. So we now have access to, you know, more neurons in the brain, um, more diverse brain areas that can be simultaneously accessed. Um, in addition to that, you know, we have a lot of techniques and tools in neuroscience that allow us now access to specific cell types, right? So being able to go into the brain and understand um, or highlight the activity of different neuron types as well. Um, and then, you know, getting more and more complex behavior, free behavior, and as well as longer recordings. So um, in my lab, we try to develop new tools that allow us to kind of tackle a number of these different emerging challenges coming from, you know, these new data sets. And over on the right here, this is um, from a preprint that isn't our Seeing the Forest and the Tree preprint, but they also have a similar title. <laughs> um, just kind of showing this like diverse uh, set of data that we can now collect from the brain. Um, whether it be, you know, with probes that allow us access with really high temporal and spatial resolution at a level of individual neurons and their spiking behavior or dynamics, all the way to a lot of like optical methods um, using calcium indicators or other ways of being able to um, assay either populations of neurons or as we kind of scale these technologies up to see larger and larger um, fields of view over more and more neurons. And so with all these new data sets, we new, need new ways to model the activity um, arising. 
So what are some of the challenges that we're facing when dealing with, you know, taking um, these collections of brain data and trying to understand some underlying behavior? So um, we have a number of challenges. You know, one of them is there's a lot of noise and variability in neural responses. Um, the example here is just showing, you know, even if we present the same stimulus, you know, maybe even a very simplified stimulus, which in this case, just looking at like a visual decoding task where we have, um, you know, a drifting grading of some orientation. So we know that if we present, you know, the same stimulus over and over to a neuron, oftentimes the responses that we get back from that neuron can be highly variable. And so this kind of figuring out exactly um, how to uh, account for this, these sources of noise and variability, of course, has been a major challenge in building robust models of, of brain activity. So, you know, as we've grown in terms of the scale of neural recordings, instead of looking at single neurons, as I've kind of alluded to, um, there has been this sort of uh, way to move forward in terms of, instead of looking at individual neurons, we'll instead look at populations of neurons. And if we view them now as a sort of, um, I'll go, go into more details of this sort of state space view, but essentially thinking about this collection of neurons is sort of charting out some sort of trajectory or path on some underlying neural manifold. We can actually see that even though individual neural responses might look quite variable, um, at the population level, we actually see far more stability um, in the underlying trajectories of, of neurons at this population level. So this has been a really exciting advance because we can sort of, by abstracting away from single neurons, we can start to see how collectively they're actually doing something that's that's quite stable and, and repeatable and, and robust. Um, but unfortunately, the... Oh, sorry, I'm missing. Um, so even though we can now take populations of neurons, kind of abstract away from the individuals, and then look at the activity jointly, um, this has been actually very challenging as a sort of way to build inference from brain circuits, because each time that we go in and we measure from neurons within the brain, we often will collect or um, after some spike sorting or processing, we'll often have access to different subsets of neurons from the brain. And so um, the other challenge, you know, is just that transfer or the ability to take a model that we've learned from the brain and apply it in a new condition is incredibly challenging. And that sort of highlighted this uh, over here on the right, where I'm just showing this idea that even if I have a chronic recording that's um, able to access roughly the same sets of neurons across different days or across different perturbations, Oftentimes, the what we actually, you know, capture in the end could be a different subsets of neurons across these different sessions, and so all of these things have kind of made this population level view of neural activity quite challenging. Because if we don't even have stable recordings where we have the same sets of neurons, um, being able to build a model that can actually be applied across those different sessions is very hard. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to follow, follow after Claudia's talk um, because she gave a lot of great introduction about, you know, motor decoding and um, this sort of BMI paradigm. And so uh, in these cases, you know, in, especially in transfer and BMI, we're having um, a lot of difficulty in being able to build kind of these stable models. Okay. So let's dig a little bit deeper into what exactly I mean by like a population level view and this sort of state space um, model for neural manifolds or um, neural population activity. So what I'm thinking about is essentially, you know, I have a population of neurons that I have access to here. I'm just, um, each row would be a different neuron and then we're just plotting this out over time. So here we can see the firing activity of different neurons, essentially like in current models of you know, neural manifolds, neural population activity, what we'll essentially do is we'll take a single point in time and sort of slice through time and then build 
a vectorized representation of the activity patterns of all those underlying neurons of interest, right? And so if we have D neurons, we can think about this as a point in a D-dimensional state space, right? Where essentially all the axes of our state space would be the firing rate of all of our D neurons. And so what people have, you know, observed or the or this nice property is that, you know, even if there's D neurons, the actual activity or subspace that the the neural the the full dimensional neural activity patterns are constrained to are actually a low dimensional manifold and so here i'm just showing this idea that you know if we take a slice in time here in red or in blue and then we look at the actual embedding in that state space of this population we might see you know that it has this sort of low dimensional structure and then over time we're actually looking at trajectories through this, um, through this neural state space. Okay, so this is all, you know, kind of um, well established. Um, here's another picture of it where I'm just showing this idea and then also kind of writing out, you know, just a simple equation. So here this idea is just um, further um, described where I, we're assuming here we have like four neurons um, that will encode our point in this population space or state space. And then here I'm just looking at the evolution over time of, of that high dimensional state space. Here, Xi or X1 would be the activity of the um, first through the nth neuron. So here we're just talking about kind of building a mapping that will jointly aggregate the activity from all of the end neurons within our population into some sort of output. And here we can think about decoding of behavior or of movement as we were talking about earlier. And that's the main example that I'll show. Um, but really this could be any sort of, you know, low dimensional mapping that tells us about some behavior that we want to read out. Okay, so this is sort of just setting the stage for this idea of putting everything together into a single point and then looking at how that point is evolving in time. And so we, you know, motivated by, by some of the challenges and, you know, what I described at the beginning of the talk, we um, were interested in whether or not we could decompose this operation in such a way where we can kind of um, tackle some of the different challenges that I outlined. And in particular, we're going to think about how decomposing this differently will allow us to have representations that allow for transfer and also give us pictures of what individuals are doing within the circuit. So we'll do that um, through the kind of following decomposition. So instead of having one mapping that will go from all neurons to behavior, we're going to decompose it into two parts. And so I'm still showing the same output mapping. <coughs> Sorry, just recovering from a cold, not COVID. Um, so the breathing is a little. Great. Okay, so, um, right, so what are we going to do? So instead of passing all of our data in, building this mapping, as I showed before, we're going to de uh, decompose this computation or this transformation into two parts. The first being a function that will operate at the level of individual neurons. So this function F is applied to each of our neural dynamics individually. Right? It's not a different function. It's just going to essentially work at the level of individual neurons, but computing properties of their dynamics or of their fingerprints over time. Okay, so in that sense, we can think about taking the picture that we saw over here on the left, which is you know taking all four neurons and putting them into a single vector. And now instead, what we're going to do is look at how each individual evolves over time, right? So that's this picture here of the blue neuron or the yellow or the red and the green. Um, and then after we've actually processed each of these neurons ind uh, independently, we're then going to apply a secondary transformation, which can look at all of the neurons jointly, but now through a different function, it's going to essentially look at for a given point in time. So now throwing away the temporal or the dynamics that we saw in the first part, 
And now for a single point in time, what are the interactions across all of these different neurons within our population? And so essentially we're kind of separating this computation into like space and time where each of those two pieces are being kind of, I mean, the, the whole model, as you'll see in the next slide, is trained in an end-to-end -end manner, but you're learning both of these functions in such a way where you have this space-time separability. Um, and so here, as I'm kind of showing, it's this idea, okay, so now at a single point in time, what are the interactions? And now at a different point in time, you know, what are the interactions? And, and our goal really is to then put all that together still into a mapping of the underlying behavior, um, but doing it in this, this separable or decomposable manner. Any questions? Yes, please. Yeah, so I'm a bit... I'm a bit confused. Uh, if you go back to the last slide, you have the F applied, the individual mappings. Do, do yes. they include time? So do I map a time series of activations or do I map just this activation at a given moment? Like F uh, X1, is X1 a time series or is F1 a single, uh, is X1 a time series of the activations of neuron one or is it yes. just? So, so this is a slight abuse of notation. So I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> so it is true that F is operating on, on the dynamics or over time for a given neuron, but the actual representations that we're forming aren't just going to compress that whole neuron's time series into a single vector. We will actually be kind of forming a time varying embedding of that activity, but at the first pass, we're only able to see the dynamics of a single neuron that's fed into the model. Okay, but I guess my question is, uh, for whatever the output of F is at a given time step is, do the inputs take only a single time step or do they take a window of, of that neuron or do they take the whole piece of that neuron? Like that's that's what I, not clear to me. Oh yeah, no, it's a great question. And hopefully it'll become a little more clear after I kind of like go into the details of the, of the particular model that we've implemented. Um, but to answer your question, it sees a longer sequence of time for that neuron. And we're going to implement this within a transformer model. So the sequence that we're feeding in, it's it's streaming in time. And so you'll be getting in new batches, but the, but the length of time over which we're actually computing those embeddings can vary. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying. Okay. So as I sort of alluded to, um, in order to, so, so you can think about this separable decomposition as really being implemented in many different types of architectures. You could build this into an RNN, um, but we chose to, or at least in our, in our um, model, the embedded interaction transformer or EIT, we implement this with a, a transformer, um, you know, mainly because it's a very flexible architecture. Um, it's one where we can, both learn from the dynamics of time series, right? So we can use self-attention to find non-local interactions that might be happening over time or in the sequence of, of that neuron's activity. And then at the same time, we can also use a transformer to find these like interactions that might be happening across neurons, potentially in a non-local way as well. So the transformer kind of gives us a, a flexible way to incorporate or to learn both pieces of these this mapping. Okay, so let me just break the model down um, further. So um, as I kind of showed in the in the previous slide, we'll have like these two different modules or these two different mappings. Um, both of them are learned jointly, and each are going to be implemented with a transformer that uses self attention. Um, so essentially, we call it like our individual transformer or interaction transformer. Um, the individual is going to process, as, as I've already said, single channels. So here I'm showing, you know, each of these different um, spike trains um, being fed into, it's the same, the same transformer, so there's a shared weights, but kind of unraveled here. Um, and, and as um, you know, the, the question we were just talking about, um, we could have a very long sequence of neural activity, um, but then from that, we're going to essentially bin the neural activity into short segments of time 
And then that's going to form the tokens of our sequence that we're going to pass into the transformer. So in you know standard applications with an NLP, you would have each word as a token, right? And you have a sentence, which is your whole sequence. So here we're just treating points in time as sort of the way of tokenizing this whole sequence. Um, okay, and so now you'll fix the length and I'll see, we'll see some examples where we have a shorter or a, a sort of longer length and how that impacts the decoding. Um, we'll, you know, plug each, you know, each neuron into this individual transformer. Okay. And now it can see however long the sequence is that you're passing in. So it has the ability to extract features from neurons over time. Okay, and then in the second stage, um, we're going to slice through time. So um, the individual encoder is producing embeddings that are time varying, right? It can see a whole long sequence, but then it forms different embeddings that are temporally um, varying. And then we're going to slice through, so take the embeddings for all of the neurons that we have recorded from, so shown here. We're going to slice in time over those uh, neuron embeddings, and, and then essentially they're going to become like a long vector, right, of all of these different neurons all lined up. And now we're going to apply another transformer, kind of more of like a vision transformer that has no positional embedding, meaning um, in the first pass, it knows about time, right? Like temporal dynamics are kind of encoded into the model through what's called a positional embedding. But then when we're talking about space, there's no, there's no reason why we should believe that neuron one and neuron two are closer to each other than one and four. This actually doesn't have any, um, you know, connectivity information between those neurons. So in that case, we get rid of all of the positional embedding. And then here, we're just really learning the self-attention mechanism across all those neurons in order to form an estimate of their interactions. Okay. And so... Essentially, we have these two different components, both transformers, one working in time, the other working in space, and both of them are trained jointly towards some sort of a regression or classification task. And so in the cases that I'll talk about, um, the examples here are from a, a movement decoding task, similar to what we heard about earlier this morning, <laughs> where we have, um, you know, recordings from motor cortex while animals doing some different um, reaching or movement tasks. And then the goal is to predict the, the kinematics, the velocity or the reach direction. So that would be an example of how you could train this in an end-to-end -end manner, but really the architecture is quite general and so can be trained on a number of different um, downstream tasks. Okay. And here, just this projection module is just moving us from the high dimensional space of these embeddings, which could be, you know, um, many dimensions down to the, the corresponding label of interest. Okay, and so um, to come back to one of the earlier motivations, what's really cool about this is so, now that we've kind of decomposed our, our functional mapping in this way, it now is able to take in individual neurons, right? And it doesn't rely on the ordering or the size of the population that we started with. So typically if we were to train, um, you know, a transformer, RNN, whatever, at the population level, you know, if we now permute the order of the neurons that we started with, the whole mapping is completely obliterated, right? And so essentially um, what we've done instead is we've allowed ourselves to operate at the level of single neurons, which now can allow us to transfer to new data sets that could be different sizes and potentially different orderings or subsets of neurons. And we're really excited about, or you know, think about the possibilities and I'll, and I'll show you results. Um, to demonstrate that we might be able to use this idea to actually learn from dynamics from one brain 
and then use that model in some you know, pre-trained manner to be able to extract information on a new day or from a completely different animal's brain where neuron correspondence is, is not possible. All right, okay. So now we can, um... oh, I'm actually running low on time. Wow, okay. Um... No, it just, okay, great. So, um, okay, so now we can look into the accuracy or the performance of this. Here, I'm, um, I'm applying this to um, an angular regression decoding task from non-human primates. This is actually coming from Lee Miller and Matt Parrish um, at Northwestern when I was there as a postdoc. And um, so we've heard about some of these animals earlier today. And in this case, it's just a classification task, so a center outreaching task, eight different targets. Um, and here on the left, I'm just showing the performance for a very short sequence, so just two bins. Um, there are 100 milliseconds, so 200 milliseconds. Um, and then over on the right-hand side, just looking at six of the tokens being passed in as a sequence. Um, we have four different data sets here coming from two different individuals on two different days. So one individual C1 and C2, and then another individual M1 and M2. Um, and so we're comparing, you know, this, this is our model, the EIT, and then we can also train this so that it only has the temporal component of the transformer. So instead of having the time and space, we can also do this in um, like using a purely um, temporal EIT. And here we're comparing also with um, uh, what's called the neural data transformer. So a transformer model that's processing all the neurons jointly. And so we can see that across the board, we get you know, really competitive and state-of-the-art decoding performance with the EIT model. Um, and this happens, you know, of course, with a larger sequence, we can further improve the accuracy on this decoding task. Um, and then in addition to this kind of more simplified classification task, we also tested this on some data sets from the new neural latent benchmark, which is a more complex maze task. So the animal has to make like non-stereotype reaches depending on the source and target destination in the maze. And in this case, it's a regression task. So we're actually trying to do real time uh, velocity and position decoding. And so what we find, again, is that we get very good performance on this task that's pretty comparable to the NDT, which one might expect, right? Like if you take all the neurons jointly, you have this very powerful transformer, you can do pretty well. And so we're finding that this decomposition in these tasks doesn't hurt performance. Um, but of course, you know, what is the really exciting piece of this that I that I've kind of motivated is this ability now to potentially transfer across different animals without having to retrain the underlying, you know, weights of our transformer model. So that's what I'm showing here are cases where we're trained on a single animal, so or a single data set um, that will have a some set of neurons, right, attributed to it. And then what we can do is we can actually now take the front half of our transformer, right? The front half only processes individual neurons. And so in that case, um, we can easily, even with our pre-trained model, plug in a new data set with a new set of neurons. But now um, the second half of our model, the spatial half of our model is actually dependent on the precise ordering of the original set of neurons in our data set. Um, and so we can't use the interactions that it learned in the second half of the model, but we can use the front half in a fully without any retraining. And then basically what we're showing here is if we now, if we have a pre-trained model, plug in all of our new neurons from any new population, concatenate them, and then we're just showing the decoding accuracy from just a linear readout using a small number of labels on those pre-trained embeddings. And so here, um, what we're actually finding is that in many cases, whatever the EIT temporal transformer has learned actually has enough richness in it to, in this, you know, kind of a no retraining way, 
by concatenating all these embeddings um, with a linear readout, we can actually do better than models that are trained within the same domain, trained and tested in the same domain. So this is actually showing, you know, really surprising and exciting results on um, transfer and moreover, our ability to potentially generalize models and train models on um, different brains of different numbers of neurons without this sort of um, dependence on the size or, or permutation um, of the underlying neurons. Okay, so I think I have 10 minutes left and we wanna have time for questions. Um, so I'm gonna kind of go through this next part pretty quickly. Um, just to say that, you know, we tested the model also in kind of other domain generalization cases where we'll only give, you know, a small number of reaches and then test on the rest. And here finding, you know, even more so the robustness of the model is quite impressive. And um, another thing that, you know, we're excited about doing, and I think in the last five minutes, I'll kind of talk about some related work in a second project um, that kind of hits on this. But so another thing that we can potentially do with this model, in addition to you know testing its ability and transfer, is we can also think about how how the embedding or how the representation of each neuron within this model might actually tell us something about the underlying function or some properties of those neurons, right? The model might want to try to put neurons that have similar properties into similar parts of the latent space. And so here, um, I'm just showing some investigations where we're kind of looking at those latent embeddings for different neurons, and then, um, you know, seeing whether or not that kind of has correspondence with their tuning properties or other aspects they're in. And so here, we're just using um, like, a Washerstein based discrepancy to try to find nearest neighbors within this embedding space. And we do indeed find that, you know, there's very similar functional tuning in terms of those neurons that are being um, embedded in very similar ways um, within the latent space of the network. And then those dissimilar neurons, right, that have, um, that are further away in their Washerstein distance do seem to have like anti-correlated tuning. Um, okay, so the summary of, of this part of the talk, which I guess will be the most, uh, most of what I cover today, is, um, you know, I introduced this idea of the inter, uh, embedded interaction transformer. Um, really, it's this idea of being able to take population level um, dynamics from the brain and decompose it in this like space time separable way. We show that this can be used to, to do transfer across animals and, and across sessions. And um, we think that this is kind of an important aspect of what we'll need if we're going to build foundational models or models that allow us to train on a lot of brains or a lot of data. We need to, to break this sort of dependence on the size and ordering of our, of our data sets as inputs. And um, we're really excited about this idea that we can get and extract representations of individuals um, and how we might be able to relate that to underlying cell types and whether or not cell types could be a way um, to that, you know, these, these models could also potentially organize the activity and tell us things about interactions across, um, uh, across different cell types within a circuit. Okay, and so to that end, we have been developing models that instead of looking at populations, um, you know, are looking at whether or not we can tell or fingerprint from the activity of neurons in vivo and actually say things about their underlying genetic cell type. And I won't have time to talk about this, but if anyone is interested in talking about these kind of ideas further, I'm gonna be around, would be happy to, to kind of discuss. Um, but we do have a preprint of this online. Um, essentially, we find that we can extract a number of different inhibitory and excitatory cell types from the in vivo firing activity of, of neurons um, within both calcium imaging as, a, as well as electrophysiology data sets from the Allen Institute. And again, 
it's not exactly a transformer, but we're using attention as a way to kind of zoom in on certain periods of time where a neuron is kind of characteristically firing in some way that makes it distinct from other cell types. So we've developed this architecture that allows us to do cell typing from, from neuronal activity. We've applied it to um, three different open data sets from the Allen Institute to the Brain Observatory with calcium data, where we have tree lines to actually um, tell us the different cell types, uh, a biophysical model of V1, and also neuropixels data um, that's EFIS, where you have opto tagging of the different cell types. This is a supervised model, so using attention. Um, and we've done a number of investigations to kind of dig into, you know, what is this model pulling out? Um, how is it zooming in on specific firing patterns of interest? And what does that mean for these underlying cell types? Um, and then finally, I'll just say that, you know, in the first part um, of what I was just showing with the cell types, we were using kind of simplified stimuli, so drifting gratings within the visual cortex. Um, but what we found is that if you actually train this model on diverse conditions, so both drifting gratings and naturalistic movies, we see this huge improvement in our ability to actually discriminate different cell types. Um, and so showing that, you know, through deep learning and these more expressive architectures with more complex data, we can start to, you know, kind of tackle this, this question in a pretty rigorous way. All right, um, so that was a very quick tour um, through this uh, model for cell typing um, using global attention um, and showing that we can do this on calcium data sets as well as EFIS. Okay, so I will um, end by acknowledging all the amazing people that contributed to this work. So the EIT model that I described at the beginning, um, Ran Lu and Mehdi from my lab, um, as well as, you know, ongoing collaborations with folks at DeepMind, which led to this. And then in the second part, um, the cell typing, this is joint work with Keith Hengen's lab and Aidan Schneider, who also co-led co that work. And um, I'll end there and open it up for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eva. So we will have time for maybe two questions. Uh, hey, hi. Um, thanks for the very nice presentation. I have a very quick question. Do you think this is applicable to maybe MEG, EEG data, or even like uh, highly with uh, fMRI data with high uh, temporal resolution? Yeah, it's a great question. So in the the paper for the embedded interaction transformer, um, we also tested it on um, like a many body system. So kind of more generic time series, um, you know, coming from populations of interacting particles in that case. So we definitely like the model itself can be applied to more general time series. And you can definitely imagine cases where, um, I mean, maybe less so in fMRI because because you have a little more correspondence between voxels between two different brains. Um, so it, it's maybe less clear how the fully separable temporal piece of it could be useful in that case. But certainly when you have, you know, other implanted arrays or MEG um, where the, the correspondence might not be as clear, then maybe doing this kind of separability could be helpful. Um, but yeah, anytime with multi-channel data sets. So it'd be, it'd be cool to see how these ideas manifest in other domains. Thank you. Hi, Hello. thanks for a great talk. So I wanted to know whether you guys have explored um, actually doing the cell type classification with EIT, kind of in the vein of the foundation model philosophy, like. It would be nice if you could pre-train on a bunch of cells data, get the dynamics of different cells, and then find, say, that you can classify cell types with very few actually labeled cells uh, in your task. Yes. I mean, no, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome idea. And um, yeah, this is like, there's both of these projects kind of evolve from different directions, but then kind of there's some now nice intersection point between the two. Right. So both 
can we use EIT, which is using populations at the beginning, to form embeddings right now we're doing this in a in a supervised way so we have some sort of downstream behavior but the same thing you know we could use cell type right yep. <laughs> as that label um and then in other directions you know moving more towards like a self-supervised training where we don't have a particular downstream task and then they're maybe using cell type as a readout or um yeah i mean i think Right now, when we're applying this on the motor cortex data, we don't have any underlying labels about what those different neurons are beyond their, their like tuning profiles. And so it does give us a way to find those embeddings. It would be interesting if we had other labels about the different cells to see how they're being organized in the model yeah. space. And then on the second hand, yeah, you could also imagine using the low cat or using something where you're just trying to find um, single neuron embeddings or or combining them in a different way through population. Yep. Yeah. Cool. cool. Yeah, we'll Thanks. discuss more later. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. I have a quick we, oh we'll we'll take one question from Zoom and then okay. over to you. Sorry. So uh, there's this question from Quindley. Is the improvement seen in the cell type discrimination an effect of the amount of data used in the training? Uh, was a downsampling procedure used to match the volume of data used in both cases? Uh, good question. And that's something that we are trying to kind of um, figure out currently. So it, it could be that just having more diverse data um, could be part of the reason. Um, but I guess... Um, so, I mean, so for our model, having more data does significantly improve performance, but for all of the baseline models that we tested, they actually don't improve when they have more data. So, so it could be that like a kind of combination of more diverse data along with the expressiveness of this particular model, um, you know, could be part of the reason why we're seeing those improvements. Um, we also have done some analysis of like, figuring what are the most salient trials like what are what are the points in time where the model deems you know really important for the classification and we found that once we combine everything versus just training on either domain independently we find that the most salient trials for either condition kind of converge and become more stable um so it might be showing us that it's found something that's common across the conditions that are actually more informative and, and helpful for the task Cool. Yes. Good. Okay. Uh, really great talk. Um, I had a quick question on the spatial uh, sort of inference from the transformer. So we used to think about interactions between neurons in terms of correlations, which are sort of linear interactions between them. And a transformer head, I'm assuming you're using softmax here uh, in, in your selection process. So, or maybe the, I guess that's my question, right? Like, are you using softmax or have you tried using more... Um, sort of subdued uh, uh, sort of selection process in the transformer head. And it's just doing a huge difference, right? In the spatial embedding. Ah, interesting. Um, so we do use softmax. We're not doing anything like, um, it's a pretty vanilla transformer in that regard. And we haven't looked at like inducing other forms of, of attention or, or relaxing it a little bit. It's an interesting question um definitely to your point of like oh we think about this as linear correlations right yeah. um presumably there is highly non-linear interactions and this would be able to capture that That's right um but yeah maybe you could also use the correlation somehow to like constrain mm -hmm. some aspect of the interaction like if you had good inductive bias that you could impose on that positional embedding um, then that could be helpful just if with less data or to, to find something that right. like kind of be more grounded and interpretable. Yeah, um, I suspect the softmax is very aggressive into tuning something out, like finding the the, the I see, the yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be interesting to see. If That's a good point, yeah. yeah. And especially for more like heterogeneous populations, yeah. like we were kind of motivating with the cell types, um, it doesn't make sense to just, yeah, kind of. 
do it all have all neurons have attention in the same way either right it kind of is supposed to picture or pick up some aspects of their connectivity which we know would be very different as well so cool, cool. Thank, you. thank you thank you all last question okay <laughs> all right so apologies if i missed that but do you try the individual transformer do you try to see if they were equally able to embed task evoked activity and more like intrinsic spontaneous uh, variations in, in, in the spike trains? Uh, yes, good question. Um, so yeah, the question was about if, if it's picking up things that are like task-based versus more spontaneous. And so in this current instantiation, it is supervised. And so we are going to be tuning to those things that are relevant for the given downstream task. Um, but as I was sort of saying um, with Blake's question, I think the next natural step for this is to do something that would be self-supervised. And then in that case, it should be able to pick up on all on on the different aspects or spontaneous activity that might be indicative or helpful for um, yeah, predicting interactions or some other um, non-task driven uh, yeah, label. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot.